today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, beginning in verse 19 to, to verse 31. And let us pray. Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit now to open these words to us and speak to our hearts. Help us. Help us today. Listen and hear and be changed. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to come from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. And he answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets, Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone comes back, rises from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Probably a question we all have, maybe we're Maybe we ask it, maybe we're afraid to ask it, but what we want a glimpse into the next life, don't we? Don't we want to know what lies beyond this life? Now, sometimes that conversation makes us uncomfortable. I mean, this life is all we know, so when we talk about death, it makes us uncomfortable. So, We wish someone would tell us what to expect. What about heaven? What about hell? Is there a heaven? Is there a hell? Well, Jesus gives us the clearest picture in this parable of what both are like. He gives us the destinies that await us and what we can do about our destiny. So this this parable is a parable of contrasts. A contrast between these two men, a a contrast in their destinies after their death. Why have they ended up in these differing places? And how do we determine which will be our destiny? So let's, let's look at the rich man first. This man's lifestyle is beyond rich for that day. The text tells us that his clothing was purple, a a sign of richness and royalty. And and linen, which is a rich material. He, He ate well, probably at every meal. And he seemed to ignore the man that was placed by his doorstep. Well, the stark contrast is vivid between these two men. Here's a paralyzed beggar because it says he was placed at the door. He was hungry, his body was covered in sores, and and even dogs came and licked his sores. Now we might think, oh, isn't that sweet? A little puppy comes and licks his sores. But I think Jesus is kind of implying that that's not the case, that these are mongrel dogs and they're not treating him very well. They're not really trying to soothe his agony. He was a repulsive sight. He is the epitome of helplessness and neediness. But notice he's given a name. He is the only person in a parable who has a name. And notice the rich man is not given a name. Now here's the other contrast. 
His name is Lazarus. And do you know what the name Lazarus means? God is my helper. God is my helper. Seems kind of a, a, a big contrast, doesn't it? The name doesn't seem to fit. Well, then Jesus says they both die. First, he says the poor man dies. Now, there's no mention of a funeral or what happened to his body or that anyone even noticed. But he says the angels carried him to Abraham's bosom, which is another way of saying he went to heaven. And then the rich man dies. Now, from what, how Jesus phrases this, I'm, I'm thinking that there was a lavish funeral that there were probably lots of people there and they praised this man because he was rich and the, the theology of the time is if you're rich, God has blessed you. But in verse 23, we find that he is in Hades, which is the place of the dead before the final judgment and hell. And it's not a place where they can find a reprieve. A great reversal of fortune, isn't it? You know, the, the trials of this life will be rewarded in heaven. And, and that, that's good news for those who experience trials. So what is it like in this destiny for each of these two men? Because it, it gets interesting. and Because Jesus gives us a glimpse into what these two locations are like. First, the rich man is in Hades. He's in torment. All of his wealth. All of his friends, all of his richness in this life could not prevent this torment. He is, a, he is in agony in this fire, this eternal heat. You know, if you think about it, is there any greater injury or pain than being burned? Just even a little burn on your skin, it, it, it really hurts. This, this is beyond imagining the agony. Pastor Tim Keller was asked one time, do you believe in literal flames? And he says, no. I believe it's worse. I believe it's much worse. But here's the thing. This, this rich man can see into heaven. And, and he sees Lazarus there with, with Father Abraham. Now, it appears to me that Lazarus is oblivious to all this that's going on. And, and you know, that's good news. When we're in heaven, we're going to be focused on Jesus. We're going to get to be reunited with our loved ones. And it's funny that this rich man still thinks he has power. It's kind of like, uh, Abraham, send, send Lazarus down here to just dip his finger in water and put one little drop on my tongue. That would be enough. I think it's also interesting he spoke the beggar's name, isn't it? He knew his name. And yet there's no indication he paid any attention to him when he was alive. Abraham reminds them that, you know, you both are receiving your rewards. You're both receiving what you deserve. He says, Lazarus is receiving his reward after a horrible life. Heaven is the reward for those who remain faithful to Christ and for those who endure in this life for Christ's sake. Plus, Abraham says there's a gap, a gulf, a barrier, if you will, that prevents any intermingling between the two locations. You see, the agony of hell is the agony of regret and the agony that it's too late. So the rich man makes one more demand of Lazarus. Send him to my living brothers and warn them before it's too late. Now we might think in this that this man has finally had a change of heart. But really this is almost a jab at God. 
If only God had communicated more clearly to me my choices, I would have listened. He's blaming God that he's in hell. Paul says in Romans 1 that since creation, God's power has been visible and that people have no excuse. So Abraham says, you know what? They have the scripture and that's all they need. Now, it got me to thinking as United Methodists, how do we view the scriptures? And this is from the Articles of Religion in our Book of Discipline, Article 4, and you can read there that we hold Scripture to contain all things necessary for salvation. In other words, everything we need to know about God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and salvation and heaven and hell is contained in the Bible. John Wesley was always called a man of one book. And that book was the Bible. So if one reads and applies the words from the Bible to their lives, they'll find the path to eternal life. So the rich man makes one more plea. But if Lazarus came back from the dead, that would surely wow them. They, they'd believe them. And, and Abraham says... But if they don't believe the Bible, a miracle won't make any difference. It begins with taking the Bible seriously, he says. And throughout the Bible, miracles really were not effective in melting stony hearts. Miracles were done to affirm the validity of the scriptures. So now we come to the question we all want to know, how did these two men end up in these two locations? As, as we've called this sermon, a tale of two destinies. A tale of two destinies. Now, a, a cursory reading might indicate that it was their social and economic situations that caused them to be in these two different places. We would think, well, all the poor will end up in heaven and all the rich will end up in hell. But the Bible does not support that view. So why has the rich man ended up in hell? And basically, as Jesus tells this, he refused to listen to Scripture. He refused to listen to God's Word. He failed to act with a heart of love He ignored the poor beggar who was at his door every day. Now we could ask, do do I see myself in this parable anywhere? Do we ignore people in need? And, and, And so if he ignored the poor beggar, it's because he ignored God. He failed to take the words of Scripture to heart. He failed to offer mercy and love. He ignored those around him and he focused only on himself. And now it's too late. Now we're not told why Lazarus ends up in heaven. But the Bible is clear that it is faith alone in Christ alone. There is no other way to have eternal life. In fact, Jesus says in the Gospel of John in chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one. You know what that means in Greek? No one. No one comes to the Father except through me. I read a sad statistic from a survey, and it was done by Pro Ministry, and it said 60%, get that, 60% of Christ, Christ, identified Christians in America between 18 and 39, 18 and 39, believe there are multiple ways 
to salvation, and Jesus is not the only way. Now let me be clear. There is no other way. No, none of these other paths are as clear and simple as Jesus' death on the cross as payment for our sins. All we have to do is place our faith and trust in him and turn from our sin to follow him. Another comforting passage, uh, the verses prior to this one in John 14, verses 1 and 2. Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. Now we're always accustomed to King James saying, in my father's house are many mansions. And Jesus goes on, if that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. <coughs> Comforting words from Jesus. So here's our question. How, how do I uh, prepare? How do we apply this parable to our lives? What is Jesus' purpose? Maybe it's a wake-up call. Because when this life is over, we will either live in one of two places. We will all live forever somewhere. Jesus is saying heaven and hell are real. And I hope each of us want to spend eternity in heaven. And so here's the key. Our present relationship with Jesus Christ will determine our eternal destiny. Our present relationship. If we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, our destiny is heaven. If we do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, heaven will not be our destiny. So if, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the only way to eternal life, then this parable gives us comfort about our destiny. But it should also focus us on our mission. I mean, the rich man was concerned, finally, about his brothers. He was concerned, finally, about others. But for him, it was too late. So our mission as a church is to those who have not turned to Jesus Christ. Our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ, to be a sweet aroma, as Teresa said, to be that sweet aroma that they go, I want what you've got. I want to know who you know. We're, we're there to help others take their next step towards Jesus. And those, those steps are for all of us. All of us can still take that next step. None of us have arrived yet. So we can all take the next step closer to Jesus. We can all, from those who do not walk with Jesus, and take that step towards him, to those of us who do walk with Jesus, to take a step closer to Jesus. So if you've not committed your life to Jesus, then this parable presents two options, two possibilities after this life is over. So what determines, what determines our destiny? Faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross for our sin. His resurrection, his ascension. I would invite you to take your bulletin and look on the inside. We have this every week. Um, and if, if, if we look at this, here is what's often called the Roman road. So how does it begin? It begins, I acknowledge I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Now, do any of us like to call ourselves sinners? I mean, we're, we're good people. We're, 
We're in church. We're, we're good people. We don't sin like those other people out there, do we? If we don't put God first, we've sinned. If we don't put, and we have to all admit, I'll admit, I don't always put God first every moment of the day. But it's, it's, my, it's my desire, it's my goal. If we, if we love God with every fiber of our being, if, if we love our neighbor ourselves, but we don't always do that, so we sin. Yes, we are sinners. And so we need to repent and turn away from that sin. And then the next step is then we're looking, well, what will take care of my sin? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. And this is to trust that Jesus paid the full penalty, penalty for my sin. And then we confess, not only with our mouths, but with our lives, to be that sweet aroma to be popcorn, folks. I receive Jesus as my Savior forever. I, I surrender control of my life. And there's also another rub. We don't want to give up control, do we? But just to rest in Jesus. He will see, see us through. This is to accept what God has done for me and in, for me and in me and what he has promised so how does this parable help us live today? If, if you trust in Jesus, you can live forever in his presence. Come what may, we know that we have the ultimate home. My wife and I travel differently, with different philosophies. She would, she would just say, you know what? Let's just drive till we're done, and then we'll find a motel. Don wants to have the whole trip mapped out. <laughs> and he wants to have a motel secured that evening. I like knowing that I've got a place to spend the night. I like knowing I've got a place to spend eternity. This... This is, this is what it's all about, folks. So I, I pray we've all made our commitment to trust in Jesus and that he, he is our Savior, He is our Lord, and He has opened up heaven for us and that we want that for everybody. So... I, I trust that this gives us hope that whatever, whatever happens in this life, God promises eternity in his presence for those who trust in Jesus. If you've not done that, I invite you to come to the altar and pray, or see me later, talk to me later. Make the decision today because for this rich man, it was too late. Let's not let it be too late for us. Let us pray. Father, thank you for revealing to us what happens next. And I pray for all of us to, to make that step. Do we do it perfectly? No. Do we fully understand everything about it? No. But we want to live daily, growing closer to you. So thank you for this, and thank you for Jesus who makes this possible. We pray all this in his name. Amen.